Welcome to Communism in the World, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation series dedicated to telling the true story of communist ideology, its history of political implementation, and the legacy of Marxist political economy. I'm Murray Bassett, Doc Director of Academic Programs, and I'm pleased to present to you today Dr. Robert Service, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, a fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and author of many works dedicated to understanding Russia and the Soviet Union. Of particular note is a history of modern Russia about to be issued in its fifth edition. This book covers the entire 20th century period and helps us to understand how 70 years of communist rule continues to influence Putin's Russia today. During today's event, Stalin and the Soviet Union, Bob will give us an overview of Stalin, Stalinism, and the Stalinist period which will help us to recognize some of the ideological dimensions necessary for understanding what happened and why it happened. We are privileged to have Bob here with us to share his panoramic knowledge of the history of modern Russia. Following his presentation, we will have a discussion with Bob, drawing upon questions submitted by the audience. You can submit questions for him throughout the event using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And with that, I, Bob, I welcome you and invite you to share your presentation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Murray, for uh, inviting me uh, to talk about one of the main figures of world 20th century history, and certainly one of the main figures in the history of communism. And I thought I'd start by saying that uh, there are lots of lots of enigmatic aspects and controversial aspects of Joseph Stalin's life. Born in the last decade of the uh, 19th century, living right through until 1953, uh, ruling what was then the Soviet Union, uh, for nearly three decades, uh, a titanic figure of our times, and not just for the Soviet Union, but for the world as a whole. And naturally, this has led to a lot of disagreement about his uh, significance. And one question about him uh, that hasn't really led to almost no controversy at all is that he killed a lot of people. He locked a lot of people up. He locked at least a million people up in the gulag uh, from the mid 1930s onwards in the labor system of camps. And at any one time, there were always more than a million people in the camps. And since they were dying in terrible numbers every year, then they were replaced, replenished by further victims annually. So this man was a killer. Back in the 1970s, there were attempts to, to try to uh, burnish his uh, record, alleviate his guilt. Uh, but nowadays, very few um, people would think that this was anything other than a ridiculous historical mishmash of nonsense. Man was a killer. The other thing that's often said about him is that he was a bureaucratic non-entity, a man who came to power through the operation of the levers of power inside the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in the early years after the October 1917 revolution, and that he was the supreme non-entity of that revolution in comparison with the other dynamic figures such as Lenin, Zinoviev, Kaminov, Bukharin, and, and some of the rest of them. Uh, I think this has begun to be questioned. I certainly have questioned it uh, regularly in the books I've written to the effect that uh, 
he came to power not just because he was a a trusted bureaucrat inside the Communist Party, but also because he was a an impressive, I'm using that word in a in a neutral sense, an impressive leader who had a following inside the Communist Party, not just then a pen pushing uh, bureaucrat. The third question about him relates to where he came from. In all of the early accounts in the 20s and 30s, it was always stressed that he was sort of the man from nowhere, the man who, unlike the other Bolsheviks, hadn't been abroad very much, didn't know foreign languages, uh, didn't have intellectual prowess and was somehow uh, from a, a much more humble background and therefore somehow only semi-educated at best. This too, I think, has to be questioned. Uh, Stalin was educated relatively well because he trained to be a priest in Georgia. And by the way, that meant that he had to speak two languages, Georgian and Russian. That meant that he had a bilingual capacity. He's known to have edited Pravda, the main party newspaper. In other words, he wasn't so lacking in talent as lacking in the emigre, Europe-wide career pattern that the other Bolsheviks had. And they tended to look down on him, but they paid very heavily for looking down on him in, in subsequent years. The other big question about him, the other controversial question about him, relates to whether or not he was a continuator of the October 1917 revolution by the communists or the gravedigger of that revolution. And that's a really big question and I'll be folding this into what I have to say uh, next. Uh, this is a really, that's a really uh, tricky question. Uh, I think there's an easy answer to it. Uh, but I'll come on to that in a few seconds. So this is by no means a man whose impact on world history is without its controversies. Uh, let me come on to how I would answer that set of questions. Firstly, as is well known, by anyone who's looked at the career of Stalin. Stalin had a number of searing disputes with the main leader of the October 1917 revolution in, in Russia, namely the founder of the Bolshevik party, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. And for this reason, a lot of romantic stories have been told about Joseph Stalin, but somehow because he fell out with his senior comrade, Lenin, he must somehow not have been a true Bolshevik. But what I'd like to say is that he fell out with Lenin about things that were of secondary importance about the things that were of primary importance, then Stalin was a continuator of the ideas of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Stalin, like Lenin, believed in the one party dictatorship. Stalin, like Lenin, <clears throat> 
believed in the one ideology, monopolistic way of organizing culture, atheism, and the whole schooling of children and adults across the Soviet Union. Stalin, most obviously, like Lenin, believed in the usefulness of mass terror. Stalin, like Lenin, believed that society as it was before the Bolsheviks came to power was a human resource to be molded, to be sculpted in the shape that was fitting for the communization of, of Russia uh, and other uh, countries. Stalin believed, like Lenin, that the current generation, if it didn't come up to the qualities required of a communist society, could be sacrificed for the benefit of the cause of communization in the next uh, generation. In all these ways, uh, the two of them were very closely knit. And Stalin, like Lenin, believed that communization would be impossible without rapid and basic industrial and technological and cultural transformation of the, the country. Russia was never going to become a, a power in the world under the communists unless it had the military and industrial might that all the great powers had. So in this really basic respect then, Stalin was a Leninist. And the idea that there was some huge separation between the communism of Lenin and the communism of Stalin is a myth. And the point that I'd like to make that's linked to this is that in the 1920s, Stalin pursued a policy of what was called socialism in one country. And a lot of his sympathizers in Western countries have continued to suggest that as a result of that, Stalin had no interest in revolution abroad. And my answer to that is, well, just tell that to the East Europeans of 1945 through to the late 1980s. Why then was the Red Army in Czechoslovakia or Poland or what became Eastern Germany or Bulgaria or Hungary? So he had this idea, which he shared with Lenin, that if the revolution stayed permanently isolated in the world, uh, then it would be prey to the possibility of invasion. And so there was a, a great deal of congruence between um, Stalin and Lenin uh, in this very important uh, respect. Where Stalin went further than Lenin was in suggesting that in order to carry out the tasks of making this revolution permanent, it was necessary to purge, to physically eliminate vast numbers of people who uh, currently existed in the country. Now, Lenin actually shared some of this view. He wanted to get rid of priests. He wanted to get rid of former Tsarist policemen. He got rid of the old Tsarist imperial family, but Stalin went further. He got rid of the better off peasants. He got rid of 
even his own leading party members, he carried out a purge that was quantitatively much more severe even than Lenin uh, attempted. So his idea of a purge then was not a psychological accident. It was part and parcel of a way of thinking about society and how you could change that society. Now, this way of thinking about society is millenarian, it's apocalyptic. It's, it's a way of thinking that has to do with the assumption that you're right, that your doctrines are correct, and that the only way to cleanse society, to purge society of thoughts that are incorrect, is to get rid of the people who are thinking them. And that way you'll have society at your mercy, you'll be able to teach young kids, girls and boys, bring them up and um, adjust them to the purposes uh, that you have uh, for that future generation. And this is what Stalin did in the 1930s with the blood purges that have become known as the Great Terror. Now, some historians have tended to suggest that the overwhelming majority of the population in the USSR came round to feeling good about Stalin. But I would remind them that there was plenty of evidence before the Second World War that the battered Soviet peasantry, that is to say the overwhelming mass of the population, felt terrible about what had been done to them in forcibly herding them into collective farms. Between two and three million people died in the Ukrainian famine of 1932 to 1933 alone. And those people, some of those people, according to uh, reports by the Soviet secret police, preferred to be conquered by the Third Reich rather than stay under the rule of Joseph Stalin. Now they were hugely misguided because actually Adolf Hitler was bent upon the extermination of the Russians and the Ukrainians. But such was the antagonism to Stalin that uh, a lot of people welcomed the Germans into the USSR in 1941. And the people who really admired or accepted, for their own reasons, Joseph Stalin, were largely people who had benefited from the education that he gave them and the privileges that he gave them as they rose up the ladder of power in the Soviet Union, the so-called promotees. He benefited, of course, from his role as a supreme leader in the Second World War because the USSR cracked the backbone of the Third Reich and occupied Berlin first before the Western Allies did. And Stalin became associated with victory in Europe. And those Russians and Ukrainians and the rest of them who had previously had their doubts or hostility towards Stalin began to have mixed thoughts about him. Not altogether positive though. The bulk of the population wanted a different sort of administration in the USSR come the end of the war, which they were about to win. 
and those people were repressed. The last thing that Stalin wanted was a change in the kind of administration that was allowable in the USSR. But he, he was beginning to get uh, a degree of acceptance and even admiration among enough people to feel more confident about his own subjects than he had been before the Second World War. And what added to this was that U the USSR had become a superpower in the world. It had become able to occupy and govern an outer empire that included all of Eastern Europe and most of East Central Europe. So Poland, Hungary, East Germany, Bulgaria, Romania, all of them fell under the aegis of Joseph Stalin. And add to that the fact that in the late 1940s, the Chinese communists, with Stalin's important military supplies help, took power in Beijing. And it really did look as if uh, the expansion of communism worldwide under the leadership of Joseph Stalin was becoming uh, a reality. So that he became a, uh, a, a substantial figure uh, on the world stage. Uh, and he reinforced his position uh, drastically. Uh, luckily for the Soviet Union, luckily for the world, he died of his many medical uh, ailments in March 1953, and none of his comrades uh, sought to give him the sort of clinical assistance that he needed to survive any longer than March 1953. So the question that arises for all of us is, what is his legacy for us today? Well, my view has been for ever since I've been uh, writing about this question, is that Stalin's achievement was to build a more realistic communism, a more effective communism than had been bequeathed to him by the leader of the October Revolution, Vladimir Lenin. He had made it more centralized, more authoritarian, more repressive, more violent, more threatening to uh, resistors than ever even Lenin um, had attempted. And as such, he provided a model to communism around the world. Um, I once wrote a book about world communism in which I looked at the various types of communism in states that called themselves communist. And it was really remarkable how closely they followed the precedent set by Joseph Stalin. Uh, it it um, was, and we have to take account of this, it was also an inspiring model to people who in the 1930s had looked upon the market economy of the West and said, this is, this is a nightmare. They've got a Great Depression all across North America, all across Europe. This is the only serious expanding economy uh, in the world, with, it, with the exception of Nazi uh, Germany. And then in the 1950s and 1960s, a lot of colonial movements who were seeking to break free from the European empire said the same sort of thing. Soviet Union is uh, a beacon of hope 
for us in Asia, for us in Africa, if we want uh, a model of how to rebuild our societies. Now, this was a, a mistaken judgment, but we have to put everything in context. Um, we have to recognize that where there are really severe problems uh, in the international uh, arena, communism has a chance or did have a chance of um, planting its message, even though the balance of the evidence is strong, but one of the worst ways of organizing uh, an economy that you want to modernize is to start with communism, because wherever it's been built, as uh, an economic model based on Joseph Stalin or variants elsewhere in the world, it's failed. Sluggishness of bureaucracy, obstructiveness of hierarchy, lack of inventiveness. Um, just 10 or 15 years ago, I looked at this in a global context, and I asked a lot of my economist colleagues, can you just give me some kind of key to an invention uh, made inside a communist state um, that has been picked up in the rest of the world and been of massive benefit? And the only example I could come up with, or that they could come up with when I asked them, was the Rubik's Cube. And Rubik was a, a Hungarian um, inventor living in a communist state who um, marketed his discovery of the Rubik's Cube, which after all is only a toy despite the communist authorities uh, of communist Hungary uh, at the time. Now, this is a, a striking example of the deadening effect, the dead hand of communism, wherever, as it usually is, it is a dead hand on market economics. And for that reason then, I think there's every reason to say Stalin was not just a moral abomination. He was a developmental disaster. Uh, the model that he built for the Soviet Union and transmitted around the world was an unconditional uh, catastrophe. And um, I think that this is now much more widely accepted than it was in the West um, in many circles um, in Europe and in North America in the 1970s and 1980s. Now it's become the standard message. And it's a pity it's taken so long for the message to be got across. I think I'll stop there, Murray. And uh, All I, right. I, I very, very much welcome questions. No, wonderful. Thank you very much, Bob, for an incredibly rich and expansive presentation. I do want to remind all the attendees that they can submit questions uh, for Bob using the Q&A function at the bottom of, of the screen. Uh, we've had a couple roll in already, uh, but I want to start knowing that there are a lot of educators uh, joining us today. Uh, I want to start by asking uh, you what advice you have on how to you know, teach this period of history. Uh, you know, how do you teach about Stalin, Stalinism, and the Soviet Union? 
Are there any approaches that you've found that you know really help to get this this time period to resonate with young people in particular? I reckon that I've always found it helpful to look at the opposition, to look at the the rather crazy ideas that people have had over the years. I mean, they've been quite popular that Stalin was somehow just a bureaucrat or Stalin was a non-entity. Give me a break. Uh, if you kill a, as many million people as, as that, you're not just some non-entity. Um, Stalin was intellectually backward. Well, no, he wasn't. He was, I mean, this is what makes him more dangerous. So uh, what I would say is, um, as a teacher, I found it good to accept Stalin in his own terms and not just to, to sort of um, diminish him right from the start, so as to make him believable. That's what I've been trying to do um, in, the, in the books I've written that um, rescue him from the um, detractors that he had in his own lifetime. I mean, the man was a political monster. We got to understand why on earth then did he get that high up the communist system and why was he kept there? And um, what sustained him in power? That's, that's the way I'd do it. Take him seriously. So following on that, in terms of primary sources, uh, what do you consider to be essential reading for, you know, let's say, high school level students to be able to really understand Stalin and his significance? Uh, and given the limited time and resources that, that a lot of teachers have in addressing this, uh, you know, are, is there any period in the Stalinist period that's most important for them to look at? I reckon that um, one's best intro into all of this is any of his collected works. Um, you say Foundations of Leninism, which um, came out in the, the mid-1920s. Um, it's virtually a punishment to say, read the whole book. Um, but to get a flavor of the way he thought, to get a sense of the almost um, biblical way he had of expressing himself, the very turgid, uh, textual finickiness that he had. Um, I don't think it matters what you read by him, and you can get it off the internet. You don't have to have it in your school libraries. Um, I mean, I, I think that actually reading him in his own words is, is, is the best good start. And that actually um, makes one realize that this, this man took himself so seriously, and yet um, he was a good teacher, you know, because he said everything two or three times in different language. Um, so he had a flair for expressing himself in a way that thuds, 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 thuds away at you. Um, that's what I would say is the best thing to do. And to get away from um, the, the works that were produced by his rivals, but it, because of course they tended to diminish him. My thing is, the thing I'm interested in pushing is that um, you don't get an understanding of Stalin by just taking the line that his opponents took. You have to understand him from the inside. Thank you. Uh, 
I think understandably, a lot of the questions are, you know, surrounding the Second World War and, you know, so the lead up to and then, you know, some of the post period. Uh, so yeah. how are we supposed to understand the relationship between the Nazis and the Soviets? I mean, of course, there's first there was the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, which, you know, starts the Second World War. But later, of course, Stalin's on the side of the Allies. Uh, you know, and how do you think that this latter fact has affected our understanding of the relationship between fascism and communism? Well, that's a that's a really big that's a really big question, and um, of course, there was a good deal of overlap between uh, Hitler's fascism and Stalin's uh, communism. Uh, I think that they hated each other, they despised each other. Uh, one of them feared the other. Stalin feared Hitler. Hitler did not fear Stalin. And the big story really of that relationship is that Hitler was wrong. Hitler underestimated the military might and cohesiveness of the armed forces of the USSR. So Hitler made an egregious error in underestimating Stalin's Russia, underestimating the, the difficulties that he might have in invading um, Stalin's USSR. So the story of the Second World War is that the longer the war went on, the more likely it was that the USSR would beat the Third Reich. But Hitler didn't understand this. That said, Stalin made some terrible errors that contributed to the possible defeat of the USSR. It hadn't been for those terrible errors in 1941, um, then the USSR would have been much more able to resist the Third Reich in the first year or two of the war than it actually was. Uh, so kind of extending that, uh, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, you know, there were certain elements of some of the captive nations that were, uh, you know, they had misplaced optimism with respect to the Nazis invading. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so they, they cooperated with the Nazis uh, in resisting the communists. Uh, when the double invasion happens and the communists are, you know, again in power in Central and Eastern Europe, were there reprisals that you know of? Uh, against these collaborators? Oh yeah, when the when the red when the Red Army went into eastern Poland and Lithuania and Estonia and Latvia in uh, 1940, under the terms of the Nazi-Soviet Pact, then there was a terrible purge of parts of the population, teachers, engineers, traders, bankers, uh, who were eliminated in the same way as they had been eliminated in the Great Terror of 37 to 38 in the USSR itself. When the Red Army came back into those countries again, in 1944 and 1945, then there was a, a doubling up, a doubling down of the same purges with the addition that anybody who had a, any connection at all with the Third Reich and its occupation of them uh, was very severely, um, very severely punished. So uh, rather than being liberated, these countries were actually resubjugated. They, 
they had a terrible time. They were subjugated by uh, either the USSR or um, the Third Reich in 1941. And then they were resubjugated again uh, at the end of the Second World War. So they were captive, captive peoples. And one of the things that's intriguing and sad about Mikhail Gorbachev's perestroika in the late 1980s is that Gorbachev didn't didn't understand this. Didn't understand why actually the Estonians and the Lithuanians and uh, the Latvians didn't just want a reformed Soviet Union. They wanted to be out of any kind of communist uh, uh, system uh, at all. They wanted their freedom. They, they did not want to be captive nations. Um, uh, this, this, is, um, this is one of the uh, things that it's hard to grasp, that they didn't feel grateful to, well, they did feel grateful to Gorbachev for what he did, but they didn't feel so grateful that they wanted to stay in the same country as him. They wanted their freedom. Thank you. Uh, so you just mentioned some of the mistakes that Stalin made during the Second World War. Uh, but looking more broadly, uh, in the course of all the research that you've conducted, have you found that Stalin believed that he was succeeding? I mean, was he confident in his ideas and how best to manage the Soviet Union? Or did he recognize, you know, at any of the economic and cultural failures of, of his system and of his regime? Well, that's a really, that's a really good question. I think that like all communist leaders, he was jittery, he was agitated. He knew that millions of people basically hated him. I mean, you don't, you don't have to purge um, so many people. You don't have to set up a gulag if you feel confident in your own uh, popularity. And the communist system survived him, although they reformed the communist system after his death, they still kept the gulag. So he wasn't um, any more than any other communist leader so, so confident about the way that people thought about him that he could afford to dismantle the authoritarian, the totalitarian system in favor of democratic choice. Um, this, this is true of all communist systems. Um, even, or, or you might say, especially the communist system in, in China, which does have a, a variant of the capitalist economy accompanies that with the most vigorous, oppressive political uh, tyranny. Uh, com communism can't work without um, the instrumentalities of, of um, incarceration, deprivation of a realistic voting system, free and open uh, exchange of ideas. It's not been invented yet. And going back to what I was saying earlier, the system that Stalin imposed um, invented this way of ordering uh, populations. This is the communist, the really existing communist system. Um, there's a hybrid at the moment in the People's Republic of China. Um, and who knows how long that hybrid system uh, will survive as it exists today. Uh, thank you.
Uh, so, so you just mentioned uh, the gulag. Uh, and of course, under Stalin, millions were imprisoned and, and murdered in, in the gulag, you know, allowed to perish. What happened to the gulag in the post-Stalin period? Ah, right. Well, uh, political prisoners began to be released in the late 1950s. There was so much hostility and lack of empathy with the ruling authorities that for their own good, the ruling authorities decided to de-Stalinize. They didn't use that term, but uh, to loosen the system. But they couldn't get any kind of uh, mental comfort from this uh, if they went to the extent of closing down the gulag. So political prisoners still existed. But by and large, by the 1960s, they adopted the principle of what they call prophylactic um, measures. They tried to intervene in, in families where the young man or the young woman looked as if he might start to adhere to a, a dissenting circle. So the numbers of actual political prisoners um, was low, it was in the tens of thousands, a still a huge number of political prisoners. Um, the sophistication of the, the secret police, the KGB, was greater, uh, and the emphasis was on making people feel so afraid that they wouldn't dream of joining an active um, op opposition group, because of course there was only one political party uh, in the Soviet Union. So the gulag was smaller, uh, but it still existed right through to the years of Mikhail uh, Gorbachev. It was a really iniquitous system and it had gradations of application so that, <coughs> excuse me, methods such as putting people into mental asylums, giving them forced psychiatric treatment as a, as a way of tormenting them. Uh, these methods were uh, introduced instead of out and out camp force uh, labor. Um, it was a more subtle form of our oppression. Thank you. Uh, just extending a little bit, uh, was there any relationship between the gulags, you know, this, these systems of forced labor and the five-year economic plans that would be promulgated, uh, especially with regard to, did, did it play into the kinds of people that would end up being sent to the gulag? Well, part of the craziness of the Stalinist economic model was that the people who were arrested on political grounds tended not to be um, overwhelmingly uh, from the laboring classes. And yet in the gulag, that's what they were um, put to doing, to hacking down the, the forests, to working in the gold mines uh, and the rest of it. Um, so, this work had to be done as a basic component of the five-year plans. So the gulag existed in everything but name before Stalin's industrial um, campaigns. The name came into existence in the late 1920s. And uh, in order to fulfill the plan, a, a portion 
of that plan had to be carried out by forced labor because some parts of the country where the gold was, where the diamonds were, where the forests were, uh, were very inhospitable and free labor uh, was not widely available. So convicts were used instead. And the result of that was that uh, as these people died in the atrocious conditions under which they worked, they had to be replaced. So there had to be more purges. Purges were needed not just for political reasons now then, they were needed for um, economic reasons. The, the whole Soviet economy could not survive and flourish uh, unless there was at least a million forced laborers. And we mustn't forget that a lot of people who were not in the labor camps nevertheless were in forced settlements where they carried out important economic activity. So there were layers of um, unfree labor in uh, the USSR. So people were sent off in vast numbers to Kazakhstan and uh, North uh, Russia and told you won't be in prison when you get there but you won't be able to leave. You'll have to stay in that region and you'll have to carry out the work that is assigned to you. So it was a level down from being an out and out prisoner, but it wasn't much um, better than being a prisoner. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned that Stalin's behavior after the Second World War showed that Stalin's communism was not restricted simply to socialism in one country. Uh, how would you describe Stalin's actions at that time? Were they internationalist, imperialist? Was this just an expression of realpolitik or some combination? I mean, why, why is it that Stalin imposes uh, one-party communist dictatorships uh, throughout Central and Eastern Europe? Well, I think the answer to that is that um, he'd never felt that the Soviet Union was secure while it was um, an isolated state. So uh, this is my view anyway, that um, uh, he always intended, if at all possible, to expand Soviet power beyond its frontiers. And he had a big bust up with Leon Trotsky about this because Leon Trotsky said, okay, let's expand them now. Let's take the risk. And the difference between Lenin, sorry, Trotsky and Stalin was that Stalin said, no, no, if we do that now, we'll get smashed. We'll get crushed. We'll be defeated. And that will be the end of the October Revolution. So he was more cautious. But that didn't mean that he was different from Trotsky in thinking that eventually security depends on us spreading communism uh, abroad. And if you want to spread communism abroad, you want the communism to look a bit like the communism at home, or else the Russians and the Ukrainians will say, hey, why have they got a better form of communism than we've got? So it has to be pretty uniform if you've got a chance of doing it. And luckily for Joseph Stalin, when the Chinese uh, made their revolution in 1949, they voluntarily adopted so many of the basic characteristics of the Soviet communist model, so that communism spread out to cover nearly a third of the world's Earth's surface in just a few years from the last period of the Second World War through to the end of the 1940s. And to that extent, Stalin thought 
history is on our side. Look, this is working. Um, our civilization is militarily powerful and unbreakable. Uh, we don't have economic breakdown like they have in the West. Eventually, um, we will attract more and more people around the world. And he looked to the um, rest of the world and he thought history is on our side. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned in your talk a number of ways in which Stalin simply continued the work of Lenin and then some ways in which Stalin went further. And so with, with respect to those uh, you know, going further, were those departures extensions of something that was already there in Lenin? Uh, or are they distortions and departures properly understood from, from Leninism? Uh, and a related question, you know, how should we address the rehabilitation of Stalin in Putin's Russia? Well, I think what Stalin did was exaggerate what was, what was already inherent in Leninism. And that he did this in order to make Leninism work effectively. The likelihood is that, St that Stalin did things that Lenin would not have done. And that's where psychology comes into it because Lenin and Stalin were different sorts of individual. Lenin was a supremely confident individual. They were both bulldogs. They were both incredibly propulsive individuals. Um, but um, Stalin went further. But in terms of the principles of Leninism, I don't think there was very much that Stalin did that in principle Lenin could have objected to. This is the terrifying thing about um, Lenin, that Lenin's, Lenin's ideas were um, terrifyingly what you might, might call proto-totalitarian. Um, Putin has increasingly in the last year or two rehabilitated Stalin. In the first years of his power, Putin um, criticized Stalin uh, while saying, look, a lot of the things that were done in Stalin's time were great achievements. So he, he had a sort of mixed attitude to Stalin. In recent years, Oh, I should say too, he's, he's gone to ceremonies, presided over ceremonies where he, Putin, has expressed remorse for what, uh, what treatment was meted out to the victims of communism under Stalin. But in the last couple of years or so, he's rode back from that and started to emphasize that uh, somehow the Soviet Union played no part in the outbreak of the Second World War, that the Nazi-Soviet pact um, really didn't um, act as the, uh, the trigger for the Second World War. And he's now adopted Stalin implicitly as being a much wronged uh, historical uh, figure. This is a really, really dangerous path for him to have trodden, at least uh, as far as the rest of us in the world are concerned. Russia has become a much more dangerous geopolitical entity than it was even 10 years ago. Thank you. Uh, just one last quick question. Uh, you know, if you were teaching high school students, you know, about Stalin and Stalinism, uh, 
uh, and the Stalinist period in the Soviet Union. What are the three points that you would try to emphasize and ensure that they understood? Well, I would say if you're trying to understand Stalin, look at him without putting on the spectacles of his critics at the time. You can criticize him without the need for somebody else's spectacles. The second thing I'd say would be look at what was happening in the world in the 1930s and the doubts that existed all around the world that the market economies would be able to come out of the Great Depression uh, anytime soon. And in comparison with that, the Soviet Union looked as if it might uh, be able to do that more effectively. But the third thing I would say is just look at the price that is paid for any kind of adoption of Stalinist methods. In the first instance, there are always millions of people in any one country who just profoundly detest communism. And I'm not just talking about big bankers, but small traders, small market stall holders, uh, small business owners, half the working class, if not more, in any one country, um, in, order to, in order to impose Stalinism, you've got to use a massive amount of violence. And even if you succeed in doing that terrible thing, you're going to end up with a cul-de-sac economically. There is no non-market economy in the world that has moved out of um, out of the first stage of communist modernization into a second stage of advanced industrial growth. Only the market economy has succeeded in this. And this is what the Chinese have understood since the middle of the 1970s and uh, their hybrid of communism and the market economy is one of the great um, the great uh, tests for our understanding in the world we live in today it's not communism as it was known even 20 years ago. It's a different sort of communism, but it is still a one party state. Uh, it is still a state that uh, dominates its population with its ideology. It still uh, uses terror against its population. It's still politically communism. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, not only for joining us, but for helping us to understand the who, what, how, and why of Stalinism. I would like to thank everyone for attending and to draw your attention to our next installment of Communism in the World, uh, which will take place in about two weeks, where we'll hear more about the China story, uh, where we'll be joined from Hong Kong by Dr. Frank DeCotter, a member of VOC's Academic Council, Chair Professor of Humanities at the University of Hong Kong, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and author of The People's Trilogy, a series of books that includes Mao's Great Famine, The Tragedy of Liberation, and The Cultural Revolution. You can find more information about upcoming events, our curricular resources, and our professional development opportunities for teachers at victimsofcommunism.org. You can also follow our work on Facebook and Twitter at VOC Communism. For the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, I'm Murray Bissett. Thank you all again for attending and have a great day.